Want to have a lot of fun, get fit, and help support a really meaningful cause this April? Join the 30-day Take On Addiction Fundraising Challenge. Just sign up to walk, run, cycle, or choose your own activity to raise money for Smart Recovery, a global leader in mutual support services that empowers people everywhere to take back control of their lives and gain total freedom from their addictions. Sign up is quick and easy. Create your monthly fundraising challenge, invite your friends, form teams, share your results, celebrate your accomplishments, and get in the best shape of your life, knowing you're helping Smart Recovery smash the stigma of addiction and heal individuals and their communities everywhere. What are you waiting for? Just go to takeonaddiction.org and start helping people everywhere lead life beyond addiction today. I'm Joan Neal, Professor of Addictions Qualitative Research based in the Addictions Department at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Uh, welcome to everyone on the call, whichever country you're in, whatever time of day or night it is, and in whatever capacity you're joining us, be that a member of the smart recovery community, a clinician, a researcher, all of the above or none of the above. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this inaugural webinar on smart recovery research. This is the first of two webinars. I'll give you details for the second before we wrap up at the end. And the broad aims of today are really to, to raise awareness of SMART and in particular the current state of play with regard to SMART recovery research, to increase interest in research in SMART recovery, but also mutual aid and addiction recovery more generally, to expand awareness of how researchers can work with SMART UK to develop protocols and deliver excellent studies so we can increase our UK evidence base and more generally to help people understand how smart recovery operates globally. Now, the idea for the webinars came from members of the Smart Recovery Global Research Advisory Committee, or GRAC. And despite being a member of GRAC, I unfortunately cannot claim credit for the webinar idea. I think that acknowledgement goes to um, Pete Kelly and Kim McCrina, who are both on the call in the background there. Uh, with a lineup of four excellent speakers, and I'll briefly introduce each of them before they talk. The format will be very simple. Each speaker talks for 15 minutes. At the end of their presentation, we'll see if there are any burning, essential, life-saving questions in the chat. And if not, we'll move on to the next speaker and take some questions in any time we have left at the end. We're scheduled to finish at 12.30 UK time, and we'll need to be quite strict, as I know many of you on the call are probably in Australia, so that's 11 hours ahead, which means it's already 10pm uh, for you. And I'm sure the webinar is going to be incredibly interesting, but you'll also be needing your beds and some sleep by that point. So I think we're hoping for about 100 people to join us. Uh, please do sit back and enjoy the talks. Um, also remember that to post any questions uh, that you have in the Q&A. And the only other thing to mention is that as with most webinars, we're making a recording so that you can watch it again and share it with others later. Uh, I don't think you can turn your cameras on or unmute yourselves. Um, so you can sit back and enjoy it. And as I say, just post to the chat or rather to the Q&A. 
don't think there's any further housekeeping, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Charlie Orton. Uh, welcome, Charlie. Charlie's Chief Executive Hello, Officer at UK Smart Recovery. She has a diverse career history with extensive expertise working across the public and private sectors, including managing clinical research, working with children and families, and leading a programme of health innovations for people living with complex needs. She joined Smart as UK Chief Exec in 2021, and today she's going to set the scene for us by giving us all an introduction to Smart Recovery in the UK. Charlie, over, over to you now. Thank you very much, Joan. Good morning, everybody. I will just share my screen and bring up my presentation. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm your warm-up act, um, and I'm going to be giving you a nice gentle introduction to um, what SMART is and the context of it in the UK. We have a very wide range of individuals joining us today, so please forgive me if some of you already know this, um, but hopefully everyone on the webinar will perhaps learn something new. So the content of my presentation is I'm going to start with the basics of what SMART is, give you an insight into its history, and signpost you some information and resources, look at how researchers um, can engage with us in the UK, um, our position statement, and finally, I would like to just mention a campaign that we're going to be running in April to raise awareness and smash stigma. <clears throat> OK, so for those of you who don't know, SMART is an acronym and it stands for Self-Management and Recovery Training. And it's a science based programme using cognitive behavioural therapy and motivational interviewing techniques to help guide and train people and how to essentially understand and manage their thoughts, feelings and behaviours. And the ultimate goal is to enable and help people to lead a balanced life. So it's a training programme. It's not um, a therapy per se. Uh, we don't diagnose people or place labels on any um, problem behaviour that they may be having. It trains um, people. It enables people to discover a power of choice and a life beyond addiction. And by that, we mean that there are many different ways that people can begin to address their problem behaviours, and this is one of them. And SMART takes um, a collection of approaches, if you like, to help people on their journey to living a balanced life. SMART tends to be offered via mutual aid, but it's also delivered in treatment by services as well. So mutual aid are groups of people with similar lived experiences who come together to help each other. And in, th in treatments or therapies, it's used by qualified practitioners, either on a one-to-one -one or a group kind of basis. And it's evidence-based. So in the UK, the way the um, health and social care sector looks at and commissions its services is through um, clinical management guidelines, and smart recovery is cited in the UK um, drug misuse and dependence clinical guidelines here. And smart, as you'll be aware of today, um, has a global footprint. OK, so here are the, some of the kind of values, if you like, in the way, in the way smart operates is um, it's very much empowering. It believes that um, the power comes from within you um, and that it's your choice. It's secular as well, so it's very open to all and very accessible. And it's empowering in the sense that our participants very much find their own way through the programme. So there is a structure to it. It's a four point programme. And if you imagine, it's like having a toolkit with four drawers. And in each of those drawers is, our, is one of our chapters in our programme. And inside each of those chapters is a set or series of, of tools or techniques and things that you can try. And our participants dip in and out of those depending on the need on any particular day or week. As I mentioned before, it's science-based. And what we mean by that is it uses established psychological tools. It's been well-researched and there's enough evidence um, to show that it, it works. There's lots of original research now happening involving SMART and key academics all over the world are now taking an interest in it. And in the UK, we're really keen to increase this portfolio and to start to develop more research protocols that are applicable to the UK's health and social care system. 
SMART's brilliant because it's relevant and can help um, all different kinds of people with all different sorts of behaviours, um, and in particular co-occurring addiction or dual diagnoses. So it's effective for those with co-occurring or co-occurrence at any stage of their recovery. And it doesn't stigmatise. A very strong value that we place on the programme is that we don't use labels. We don't use labels such as addiction or drugs or user. And we have a mission to smash the stigma surrounding addiction that takes place all across society. OK, so here are some um, facts about Smart Recovery in general. So the Smart Recovery programme is about 20 um, eight years old. It's now operating in 27 countries all over the world and so far it's been translated into 11 different languages. In the UK we make contact with around four and a half thousand people in recovery per week through our various programmes and those programmes I, I kind of refer to as a family of programmes. So we have um, the main SMART programme which helps people in addiction but we also have a military program, one for veterans. Inside Out is the program that we run for our criminal justice system for people serving custodial sentences. We have Start Smart, which is for young people. And we also have a family and friends program, which uses um, slightly different CBT approaches to help communities and the families of people um, in recovery um, understand their role how to cope for themselves and how they can best try and help um, their loved one through their journey. As I mentioned before, a lot of it is run through peer-to-peer -peer mutual aid or in services, and it can be run as a group, as a one-to-one, -one, in any kind of setting. And we also now um, run our meetings both online and face-to-face. And here are some facts about the scale of SMART in the UK. So in terms of the UK, it very first came here about 22 years ago. And SMART UK was registered as a charity back in 2006. It very first landed here through the Scottish Prison Service. Then the very first person to be trained here was a gentleman called Fraser Ross. And he was a prison officer in Inverness in Scotland. Um, and he took an interest in SMART and Joe Gerstein came over and met with various individuals. And that was the very initial um, seeding, if you like, of SMART um, in the UK. Since it came into being, um, we've trained over 15,000 people to become SMART facilitators over the years. And we have at the moment around 500 um, registered as being trained and able to facilitate in the UK at any one time. We've expanded and grown throughout the criminal justice system since it first came here in 2001. And SMART now has a presence via its Inside Out programme in 81 prisons all over the UK. At the moment in this year, 2022, just to give you an idea of, of the scale of SMART here, is we, we have organisations holding about 546 individual licences. So the way services commission SMART is through a license-based and procurement framework. Through all of those licenses, we have a similar number of meetings that are registered per week. So these are all the meetings that we keep open as live or operating on our key register. And post pandemic, we're now running 101 face-to-face um, -face meetings and just over 200 meetings online. So we've worked really hard to keep this up and running over the last two years. Um, we've seen an increase in need and an increase in the number of um, people accessing Smart Recovery. And we've seen a huge increase in the number of our publications being sold through our online bookshop, which has demonstrated that over the last couple of years, people really are proactively reaching out and finding Smart, and but in particular, wanting to use the publications and the tools for themselves, perhaps in their own home. Um, environment. So like I said before, we have about two and a half thousand people um, attending SMART meetings per week and obviously some people attend more than one a week and that results in around four and a half to five thousand individual contacts. 
So as you, I've just mentioned about need and demand, if you like, for our programme, I thought I would provide some facts about the kind of current status of um, addiction in this country. Um, I've not an animated any of these slides as I normally would in a face-to-face -face pre presentation because I thought it, it might get a bit complicated. So you can cast your eyes over this list and, and pull out any that perhaps resonate particularly with you. But in essence, there's you know just shy of 300,000 adults in this country with drug and uh, uh, contacting drug and alcohol services um, within one year. And many, many adults have reported using substances in England, in Wales. And, you know, sadly, one in three 15 year olds um, have reported taking substances in the UK during that time period as well. Now, when it comes to employment in the workplace, we know that around 70% of people who consider themselves to have an addiction are in full-time employment. And interestingly, 28% of those admit to being at work um, actively hung over or, or feeling rough, if you like, from behaviours they may have um, done the night before. And 70% of people with addiction, as I mentioned, are in full-time employment. So this is part of us um, smashing stigma as well, is helping people to realise that this affects all walks of life across all society and nobody really is immune to it at any time of their lives. We know gambling is on the increase. So, you know, there's 600,000, 6, 0.6 million problem gamblers um, in this country and a huge amount of spend and loss um, on it. We look at food addiction and the effects of obesity on our health and social care systems and huge amounts of public spending needs to go in to look after people who are overweight in the NHS or needing to take obesity medication. Gaming or gamification, if you like, is also on the rise and not just in young people and children, but in um, adults and middle aged adults as well. And during the pandemic, there's been a huge spike um, in the spend on gaming, 44.1 billion pounds a year. And that's a 30 percent increase in people with a gaming addiction. And there's really good evidence emerging now that is starting to link gaming particularly uh, or excessive gaming to um, conditions such as anxiety, stress, depression and obviously sleep disorder, as well as other things um, like losing track of time, not engaging with the world around you um, and some people um, result in preferring to have non-direct communication and relationships with people and they prefer to have online relationships only. And in terms of the most um, addictive forms of gambling, you might not be surprised to hear that they tend to be on the internet and sport. Okay, this is a busy slide. Um, please forgive me for the amount of information that's on here, but I thought given it's a, a research webinar, I would highlight some of the ways that you can um, liaise, get in contact, collaborate um, with Smart UK, how you can tap into the population in order to, to help deliver some research protocols. So as I talked about earlier, um, lots of organisations hold licences with us. These tend to be charities, publicly funded, not-for-profit, community-based kind of organisations, and they are responsible for running services at a number of locations. Um, either within a, a locality or nationally. And each of those locations will have a number of smart facilitators attached to them. And through those facilitators, you will find smart meetings running on a regular basis where you can then tap into that population um, and offer them opportunities to engage in research. Um, this is a nice wide range of participants it would offer um, quite a diverse population and it would be really good for any research protocol that involves a self-referral, uh, self-reported outcomes, non-medical types of research or where a specific diagnosis is not not necessarily required as part of your eligibility um, criteria. So that would be very much our mutual aid community based uh, groups. 
Secondly, we work um, a lot with health uh, treatment services, uh, rehabilitation centres, etc. So these are healthcare providers that usually commission SMART as a service offering. Um, lots of the meetings are run by professionals working in um, the mental health field or who are seeing patients on a one-to-one -one basis. SMART is interwoven with intercare plans or rehabilitation plans, or if somebody is out on license from serving a custodial sentence. And these tend to be a relationship where the person in recovery has um, a key worker and someone who is able to help track their process, their progress and the services and their health needs that they need to access. So these are really good for recruiting to protocols where you need a diagnosis of some kind or a well-established, evaluated um, method to determine outcomes as well. Um, and they're good for people who may have multimorbidities or dual diagnoses, if that's the kind of patient population cohort that you're looking for. Um, and they're also really good partnerships if you want to look into data. So anonymized non-patient specific information like demographics, so your epidemiology type of research. And finally, um, you can access discrete or very specific types of profile of, of cohorts or people through our individual programmes. So if you're interested in doing research with veterans, we would help you ask, access veterans who are using SMART through our very specific veteran programme likewise for young people, likewise for people in the criminal justice system. So these would be, um, this would be a useful way, like I say, if you are looking at either stratifying um, your groups, your cohorts, or if you want to really drill into a problem or a hypothesis that affects a very specific type of lived experience. This is one of my final slides and um, I find sometimes when working with large organisations it's kind of hard to establish or work out exactly what their position is on things like research and what their capability is to either engage in or support researchers in, in what they want to do. So the U UK SMART we, we support quantitative and qualitative research, so quantitative numbers, data, objective information, statistics, if you like, and qualitative research as well, which is more narrative, lived experience, um, stories, case studies, um, and themes are drawn out from all of that narrative to help reach conclusions. So we support both types of research and we obviously support any research protocols that blend the two approaches and we support that research across all the different sectors of our society and if we can help a researcher we will. We do hold evidence-based practice in really high regard I think particularly um, in the UK in the context of our health and social care system working to an evidence base is really important it's why we have the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and it's why we have clinical guidelines. So we do hold evidence-based practice in high regard and we'll help to facilitate and deliver any well-developed and appropriately governed research protocol. We very much champion the work of the Global, the Global Research Advisory Committee um, and to be able to stitch together research in quite an underserved area globally is a very very important thing because that's how we power up all of our findings and how we can collectively come together to create a big body of evidence instead of little bits of evidence sat in pockets um, all over the world so we very much champion the work of the GRAC and through the GRAC we have access to some absolute top class world-class um, academics in the field and that's really important to us as well. And finally, we take an active role in promoting research and its findings and um, where the Smart Recovery 4 pro Point Programme has relevance. And by that, we'll, we'll promote any research that has relevance that is well thought out and well governed. And one little example is I've met with an undergraduate researcher working at a college in Devon who wants to be a CBT practitioner in the future. And she's doing her final year dissertation and she wants to talk to the family and friends 
of people who support those their loved ones um, in addiction recovery. So we're promoting and advertising that through our various channels for her this week. She's only looking for three people to interview. So it doesn't matter how big or how small your research project is. If we can help you, and if we can help you find people to participate, we will. And finally, I couldn't, I couldn't give a, a presentation to this many people without mentioning and dropping in our brand new um, Take on Addiction campaign. So this is Smart Recovery International, working with its big affiliate countries, so the UK, the US and Australia. And for the first time ever, we're launching a global campaign to raise awareness of addiction and to smash stigma. And what we want to do is we want to run it in April of every year. So what we're busy designing and is about to be launched now is going to be a global campaign for people to get active in some way in the month of April. We're challenging people to take on addiction and be brave enough to have conversations about it. It is a fundraiser, but our main aim is simply to raise awareness and to start lowering those barriers um, in terms of the stigmatization of people with problem behaviors. We're looking for individuals and organizations to get behind us champion our campaign in the workforce. So if you, a friend or a loved one, a colleague or an acquaintance has been affected by addiction in any way, and if you're brave enough to take it on with us and raise awareness, we'd love you to do that. Can you do something, anything, run, walk, cycle, or do something silly in the month of April to help raise some money for us? Then we'd love to have you on board. The campaign will be launching at the end of this month and the website's already live. So if you would like to help us take on addiction and raise the profile of smart recovery and what it does, and in particular, the power of mutual aid, we'd be really delighted um, for you to join us on this campaign. And then finally, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time this morning for listening. But in particular, if anybody out there who's on this webinar feels that they would like support with their recovery, um, at any stage that you're at, please know that we're here for you. And here's a QR code and a, and a link to our meeting finder. So you'll find all of our meetings via our website. You're free to join them at any time. All smart meetings are free for you to access. They happen a lot online at the moment, so they're accessible pretty much every day of the week um, and at various different times. So if you or a loved one is struggling, please um, don't suffer alone and please reach out to SMART and give it a go and try, try some of our meetings. You never know, it might just help. And that's me done. Thank you, Jo. Excellent. Thank you, Charlie. That, that's great. I can see um, a few questions have come in on the um, Q&A. Uh, in order to keep us moving, because that's a really excellent introduction to what SMART is, how it works and where it stands on the topic of research and also how to find out more. Keep us moving. Are you OK to answer some of those questions in the Q&A and then we can move on to the next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Alison Beck? Um, sure, so just so very briefly, that there, there is a question here, Joe, that's really highly relevant um, at the moment. So somebody's asked, Moira has asked, is the Inside Out programme the same as the community based programme? Um, that's quite important at the moment in the context of the new UK drug strategy that Ed's going to talk about in his presentation because our government has released money under the ADA project for um, people working in the criminal justice system. So we are, have developed Inside Out for the community. So if you are um, a community-based criminal justice team, please get in touch with us because we have had several organizations come forward recently wanting to look at Inside Out for the community. Um, Another quick question, does Smart UK rely on volunteer facilitators to expand its services? Thank you, David. Um, we rely very heavily um, on volunteer facilitators. So in the Smart team, there's only um, nine of us on the payroll. Um, we have about 120 of our own volunteers and then about another 400 volunteers who sit within um, services. So we do rely very heavily and we're enormously grateful to our volunteers. We also do have professionals and um, if you like, and people who work in treatment services um, trained up. So it's a, it's a bit of both, but we are a very big volunteer 
organisation. Excellent. Okay, let, let me move to the next speaker and then we can pick up, perhaps, perhaps you can respond to some more in the actual uh, on, on, on screen uh, responses. And then we can come back to any at the end as well. Because there's, uh, there's clearly a lot of interest generating, which is, which is great. So the, the second speaker is uh, Dr. Alison Beck, who is a clinical psychologist and also a trial coordinator in the School of Psychology at the University of Wollongong in Australia. And prior to that, she worked at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales, Australia. So I had the good fortune to meet with Ali in 2019, which is back in those halcyon days where we got on planes and trains and did risky things like talk to each other in rooms and plan studies. And at that point, we were both involved in developing recovery-focused apps. And Ali and I were working with Pete Kelly and others on a study trial in SmartTrack, which is a purpose-built app um, capture outcome data and provide tailored feedback to adults attending smart recovery groups in Australia. But before that, Ali and colleagues had completed and published a systematic review of the evidence for smart recovery in adults. And it's that review that Ali is going to talk about today. So Ali, um, over to you. Fantastic, thank you, Joe. Um, so massive thank you to everyone who's come along today, be it morning, night or otherwise. I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to touch base around the um, systematic review and also provide a little bit of an update around um, where we're going to from here. Um, so much of today's... There we go. Um, much of today's presentation will be focused on the systematic review uh, that Joe mentioned that we did in 2016. Um, so this review was funded in part by the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence, so important to acknowledge our funding body. Um, we also had a number of um, people involved in making that review happen, and then we'll also have some additional people um, involved moving towards the future. So just to begin with, um, as Charlie touched on, uh, mutual support is something that is incredibly important when it comes to people's um, individual recovery, whatever that means uh, to the individual. It is something that is recommended by um, clinical guidelines, um, really important component of um, that opportunity to be able to change people's behaviour. Um, much of our evidence at the time of doing the, the systematic review, um, much of our evidence came from 12 staff approaches. So our AAs, our NAs, um, they've been around for a really long time, much um, very well known. And when we came to be doing this review, um, we're aware that there's no one size fits all when it comes to accessing any type of treatment or support. Um, for whatever reason, people might not engage in a 12-step approach. And so um, Smart Recovery offers an alternative. It, it gives people that choice, that flexibility over how they choose to, to spend their, their mutual support journey. Um, and so before we did this um, systematic review, before we started to look into the evidence for Smart Recovery, um, Smart Recovery Australia were coming up against um, a bit of a barrier, I guess, when people are working with um, providers, encouraging people to let their clients know about Smart Recovery and oftentimes the question was, well, what's the evidence base? Um, and so this was um, something that we wanted to help to address is to take a bit of a, a step in the direction of actually being able to um, get that conversation happening and get that um, evidence base happening. So back in 2015, 2016, um, we started to take a really comprehensive look at the literature. Excitingly enough, we were the first ones who were able to do this. Um, because we were the first ones, we really wanted to have a look at what was out there and be quite comprehensive in our approach to doing that. Um, and so what that meant is that we looked at being able to pull together um, evidence that was just published as well as unpublished um, to give us a little bit of a sense of um, what evidence is there for smart recovery? What does it say around the sorts of um, changes that people can expect to see? Are there things that make it more, more or less likely that those changes are going to happen? Things that make it more or less likely that people are actually going to engage in the program. So we're really keen to be able to try our best to, to answer some of those questions. So because we were quite um, broad in our questions, we we're also quite broad in our methods. Um, and so basically it meant that we searched a bunch of um, places. We um, use both um, scholarly as well as um, unpublished um, work and really wanting to get whatever was out there that's going to give us some kind of indication around the outcomes that we're after. So those things around what does it say about people's um, behaviour change, what does it say about engagement and things that might make um, behaviour change more or less likely. 
So we started off with many articles that we sifted through um, and then worked our way down to having 12 papers that actually met our criteria and gave us something about how smart recovery works for people. Much of those 12 um, were survey-based questionnaire kind of research, um, but we also did have four studies that provided some kind of evidence around um, effectiveness. We had, um, there was a randomised control trial um, that had been done, and that particular study looked at being able to compare um, the smart recovery groups against a program called, uh, against a web-based um, program that was uh, grounded in smart recovery. Um, and there was three treatment arms. They wanted to filter some people into the overcoming addi addictions uh, web program, some into a combination of the smart recovery and the program, um, and then some into smart recovery itself. And when, I think it was after about three months of, of running the study, but they ended up having to abandon the overcoming addictions only because people really wanted to be able to participate in the program in smart recovery groups. They didn't want to go into a treatment arm where they didn't have that option. So I guess that that's kind of a nice um, anecdotal um, uh, evidence for the, the importance of being able to attend smart recovery groups to people. Um, so yeah, we had the, the randomized control trial. There was also um, two pre-post studies that were done in um, a partial inpatient outpatient hospital setting. Um, and that program was specifically focused on being able to help people who had co-occurring mental health conditions and addictive behaviours. And that particular study compared um, one program that was a bit more grounded in 12-step um, model against a program that was more grounded in smart recovery. And in both cases, it included either the 12-step groups or the um, smart recovery groups. So that was three of the four. And then our fourth um, was a quasi-experimental study. Um, so they had um, people come through a corrections-based setting and then they compared um, people who didn't attend any smart recovery-related groups um, against people who had attended smart recovery groups um, alone or in combination with um, out here at that point in time. Um, uh, I think Getting, yeah, Getting Smart um, was the program then, which is a, a corrections influence program. So in terms of um, key findings, this particular slide and these findings are grounded mainly in those um, four studies um, because they're the ones that sort of gave us the, the clearest evidence, I guess, around the, the types of changes that, that people might be expecting to see. Um, and again, I guess this is all couched in the fact that um, at that point in time, sort of preliminary findings, but the really good news is that they were promising and that they were positive. And so if we start with that randomised control trial, so kind of an ideal way of being able to, to run a study, um, irrespective of which of those treatment arms that people got filtered into, um, there was evidence of improvement and we didn't see um, looking at the, the results, there wasn't a significant difference between um, groups. So everyone's seeing improvement from engaging in programs informed by smart recovery or the smart recovery groups themselves. And when we look just at those people that just did the smart recovery groups, um, we're seeing a significant improvement in the number of days that people are spending abstinent. If people choose to continue um, drinking alcohol, there was a significant run reduction in drinks per drinking day. And then also seeing changes in the um, consequences that are um, related to alcohol use as well. And these findings were over a three month period. Then when we're looking at the, so that was the community findings. Then when we're looking at that um, co-occurring setting, again, both groups, um, so either the 12-step informed or the smart recovery informed program, um, both are showing improvements. Um, but it gets a little bit trickier because the, the direction and the, the strength of the finding um, did vary according to um, the outcome that was actually assessed. And so relative to the A, so the AA group, demonstrated a stronger improvement um, in alcohol, um, but then on the flip side of things, the smart recovery participants um, had a stronger impact for um, fewer uh, hospitalizations and also a greater improvement around quality of life. And then lastly, we have um, our correctional setting. And in that one, um, what we're seeing is that relative to the people who went through the system without actually engaging in any smart recovery related program, um, people were much, much less likely, um, significantly less so to actually um, re-offend when they've gone through the smart recovery program. 
Um, and when they went through both the smart recovery and the getting smart, um, that sort of amplified the effect. So they saw um, a bigger effect there. So in summary, promising, we've got um, evidence that's starting to build that um, is sort of backing up what we hear anecdotally from people in the community. In terms of our other research questions, the things around, is there things that sort of um, influence the likelihood that change is gonna happen or make it more or less likely that people will see positive change? Um, again, few studies directly assess those sorts of things that might influence treatment outcome, um, but the studies that um, did do so <laughs> gave us a bit of an idea about things like attendance, for example. Um, in that randomised control trial, we're seeing that the more sessions that people attend, um, the more likely it is that you're going to do better, um, similar to kind of a dose response effect, I guess, that we get in um, other types of trials. Um, there was also things that um, happened for some of those um, survey research where we saw some correlations between things like self-efficacy and change in alcohol use. So kind of believe in yourself a bit more, have that more confidence and then start to see some of that change, which makes sense. Um, and then we've also got other evidence around um, different factors that happen in the delivery of the group, things like um, group cohesion, for example, um, has been linked to um, use of cognitive behavioural skills. Um, so if we've got sort of a, a good quality group environment where we've got quality, um, quality facilitation, we've got quality cohesion that can impact on how well people engage in the group um, and then potentially go on and change their outcomes. So all of these kind of things are sort of definitely warranting further attention. When it came to our question around feasibility, um, oftentimes it was around attendance um, that was collected. So people, um, did people attend the sessions? How long did they go for? Um, that kind of thing. But no one actually assessed any economic outcomes, which I guess is also challenging within a community setting. Um, and then we also had a couple of studies that did provide evidence for um, participant uh, satisfaction. So people really liking the supportive environment um, of the groups and really enjoying the tools and the resources and the fact that it was something that was non-judgmental. So again, we're getting this, um, this sense that um, people are engaging uh, well with the, with the smart recovery groups. What else did we learn? So they were our three key research questions, but um, just going through the process was really informative as well. It gave us a lot of information about what was out there and the sorts of things that we could really um, do to continue building momentum and continue building from the findings that were there. So um, as Charlie pointed out, there is a range of different types of um, addictive behaviours. Um, in 2016, when we did this review, much of the evidence was around alcohol. Obviously, alcohol is a really high prevalence thing, um, but we found that within this particular sample, there was no behavioural addictions that had been studied at that point in time. Um, and even with other substances aside from alcohol, um, if another substance was measured, it tended to be an illicit substance. Um, at that point in time, there wasn't any measurement of um, impact for smart recovery for other common substances, um, things like smoking or um, non-prescription um, use of medications, these kind of things, which we know are also happening and problematic, but at that point in time, um, yet to receive any attention. And one of the things that was a little bit challenging um, when we're going through this process is um, the very wide variety um, in which success was defined and measured. So it just makes it a little bit tricky to actually um, sort of pull all of the data together and get a really clear, comprehensive um, picture. And within that as well, um, there was a tendency to uh, measure success typically in terms of um, the, the behaviour or, or change in, say, for example, alcohol use or maybe an increase in sobriety. And although that's an incredibly important component of, of change, um, it's also, we know, not, not the be all and end all. There's a lot of other um, elements to recovery, to change, um, that are also important to, to look at things like functioning and quality of life, for example. So um, some really good examples of those starting to come through, but definitely um, an opportunity for, for the future. Um, and another big one that we um, noticed, um, with the exception of some of those studies that were conducted in those co-occurring settings, is that um, evidence for mental health or collection of information about mental health um, was largely absent um, from the literature. And 
we know that oftentimes uh, mental health related conditions um, and um, substance use and other addictive behaviours often go hand in hand. So it was a really exciting process to be able to get a sense of the literature and a feel of where we could go from there. So that was then, this is now, um, and it's been a while. Um, we've got five, six years um, since we uh, published the original review and um, excitingly enough we're going to be um, updating it. So back originally when we did it we searched all of the databases from the beginning of time from when they first started publishing stuff up until I think our most recent search was around April or so uh, 2016 and there was those 12 papers that looked like they were eligible for inclusion. We've just recently finished up uh, some preliminary searches and from 2016 through to now we're looking at a minimum of 17 or so that's going to be eligible. So there's really been an increase um, in research towards smart recovery. From looking at the titles and the abstracts, um, what we're seeing is that um, the RCT that I talked about earlier, they've gone and published um, some additional outcomes. They've now got six month outcomes and there's also a process articles. So really looking forward to see um, what that contributes to the literature. We've got some more comparisons um, between smart recovery and other types of mutual support groups, um, some 12 step as well as non 12 step. Um, and then there's more evidence that's coming through around um, describing participant characteristics, describing how they engage with groups and some which then take the next step and actually look at the relationship between those and outcome. Um, we're also expanding the types of populations um, that are under investigation. So there's been some work from a PhD student at Wollongong, um, Liz Dale, who's looked into the cultural um, sensitivity, the role of smart recovery in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and then as um, was mentioned um, before that, we've got um, some evidence for, for smart track that's come out as well. Um, so smart track is a purpose-built um, uh, app for being able to support um, people in their uh, smart recovery journey. Um, added benefit is that it's also um, built for routine outcome monitoring. So what that means is it collects information across a range of different domains that might change when people are, um, are working on their addictive behaviour. Um, so it can help support them in their journey and also allows us as researchers to have that real objective comprehensive evidence about the role of smart recovery. Um, and then there's other citations that are, that are coming through as well um, in terms of systematic, um, uh, sorry, the inclusion in clinical guidelines, for example, and um, work around how best to work with um, uh, referrers to, to see how they can um, refer people into the program and their willingness and their attitudes and things like that. So um, it's, it's exciting times ahead um, in terms of the research that is going to be available and hopefully the contribution it will make to the systematic review. So in summary, we have um, evidence for the, for the role of smart recovery. We're seeing the impact on um, alcohol use, on change in behaviour, that people are engaging in it um, and that it's something that, that is feasible and that people um, want to be able to do to be able to support uh, their recovery. And then over recent times, we've had an increase uh, in research. We're getting a much greater diversity um, of uh, research sample, I guess. Um, and also in terms of the, the outcomes that, that people are assessing. So I would definitely encourage people to watch this space and we'll keep you all update um, as we progress. And then if you're interested in the original systematic review, um, we've got the pre-publication version. So as accepted um, by Psychology of Addictive Behaviours, um, there's the, the link there that you're able to um, access. So thank you very much for your, your time and your um, interest in the work that we're doing. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So much going on and so much about to happen. Um, uh, before I just move on to the next speaker, I am aware we've got a query in the um, chat or in the Q&A about transcription, and I'm not sure if we can fix that behind the scenes. I think somebody was suggesting if we uh, leave the share on for a minute, somebody can explore if that's a possibility. Uh, but in, in the meantime, We've now uh, had an excellent introduction, an excellent summary of the evidence base to date. So it's time to welcome Dr. John Kelly, who is Professor of Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he's also founder and director at the Recovery Research Institute at the Massachusetts General Hospital in the US. John's got uh, a really extensive track record of research on recovery with over 200 peer reviewed articles, reviews, chapters, books. His clinical and research work has focused on addiction treatment and the recovery process, mechanisms of behavior change, and reducing stigma and discrimination amongst people experiencing addiction. 
His work on mutual aid is world leading and he's currently conducting unique longitudinal research on recovery. So I can't think of anyone better to present some breaking data and findings on people attending smart recovery and other mutual aid. So honored to have you as well. Um, over to you for the next 15 minutes. Joe, thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, delighted to be here. Just fantastic and inspiring to see the other presenters so far. And thank you all for coming uh, on this very important topic uh, of smart recovery um, in the recovery process. What I'm going to focus on, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and context for this work um, in the context of recovery, but I'm going to focus today more specifically on some preliminary results that mostly con concretize now of the baseline data of a longitudinal study that we're conducting in the United, St United States, uh, which is following uh, roughly 400 people over a couple of years who self-select into different groups, including smart recovery. So, um, you know, when we think about, of course, severe alcohol and other drug use disorders or addiction, as we uh, call it also, um, we are talking about typically a chronic cause, which uh, is difficult to get into remission and it's difficult to stay there. Um, and uh, our acute care treatment services are important. They can be life-saving for many people, but typically roughly 90% of the clinical trials that have been done are typically over 12 weeks when we know that the clinical course for addiction can last many years uh, as people start to change behavior, addictive behavior. And this, these, this is the timeline roughly for the more severe and complex cases of addiction uh, in treatment seeking individuals. So this is more severe end of the spectrum. Uh, it can take roughly about eight years to get one year of remission. And it can take another five years before that remission is stabilized and that that person is at no greater risk of meeting criteria for an alcohol or other drug use disorder in the following year. In other words, no greater risk than the general population. Now, because of that fact, the, uh, there are a number of different resources that people are drawn to and utilize to help them attain and maintain these behavior changes over time. And that accountability and cheerleading and support uh, takes place oftentimes in the community, in groups like AA and Smart Recovery, as well as many others. The evidence base for Alcoholics Anonymous, which is by far the largest and oldest of these mutual help organizations, uh, has grown substantially, particularly in the last 30 years in terms of its rigor. And this followed a call by the National, uh, by the Institute of Medicine in the United States for more research on AA, which uh, subsequently led to more funding to study AA in a very rigorous fashion. This was summarized uh, by myself and colleagues uh, a couple of years ago, published in the Cochrane Library. And what we found is that uh, mutual health groups, in this case AA, are extremely helpful in supporting remission from alcohol use disorder in particular. This is where it's been studied the most. When we look at randomized controlled trials, there were roughly 25 randomized controlled trials in this systematic review of AA, and 12-step treatments, which link P uh, patients with uh, alcohol addiction to AA. We found that AA facilitation did as well or better on every single outcome, and in, particularly in terms of uh, sustaining remission up to three years post-treatment, it did substantially better. 20 to 60% higher rates of remission for those uh, facilitated to attend AA versus treatments that did not facilitate uh, attendance at AA. We also found that there was a significant cost uh, benefit in terms of linking patients with alcohol addiction to AA in the, reign of, uh, in the range of about $15 billion in reduced healthcare costs nationally if you extrapolate the savings up to the national level. So that's significant. Improved outcomes at a reduced healthcare cost. The causal chain of that is that the 12-step facilitation treatments that link patients to AA uh, is supported. It produces better outcomes because it links people to AA. How does AA work? AA in turn has been found through dozens of mechanisms studies that have been looked at 
appropriate rigorous mechanism studies have found that AA mobilizes these mechanisms that support recovery over time in the communities in which people live. It helps people shift their social network. It boosts cognitive behavioral coping, self-efficacy, it reduces impulsivity and craving and uh, increases spirituality, which can help people reframe stress and find meaning and purpose. Uh, I would argue that although these uh, mechanisms are mobilized by Alcoholics Anonymous, they are also mobilized by other kinds of mutual support groups, including, I would argue, Smart Recovery. Now, there are a, a variety now of mutual help organizations, including Smart, which have arisen in the last 30 years. Um, the metaphor I use for, for recovery lately is this idea of a fitness center. When we think about path pathways to recovery and the choices that people, um, uh, I think, need to have, uh, to engage more people in recovery is analogous to a fitness center. You know, if you say, does, do fitness centers work to keep people fit? I think the answer is, of course, they work to keep people fit, but you have to go and you have to work out regularly, right? You can't just um, go and stand in the fitness center and expect to be fit. You've got to go regularly and you've got to work out. The challenge, of course, is how do you engage people in these fitness centers, okay? Uh, now, of course, the way that fitness centers work is that they don't just have one thing for people to do at these centers. They have maybe 15 different things. They may have 15 different classes. They may have um, different spaces and equipment and pools and courts to engage people in a variety of activities that are palatable and attractive that can engage people um, to help them get fit. So think about that in terms of pathways of recovery. Do mutual help organizations work? Of course they work, but you have to go and you've got to work the program, right? You've got to pick up the tools that are taught uh, or uh, the examples there, adopt them and put them to work in your daily life. And again, the same thing, um, you've got to have uh, ideally a variety of different things that can mutual help organizations, um, different flavors or different, um, uh, kinds of uh, things that can interact and engage people. If you only have one specific thing, historically, we've only had AA. Now that has been shown to work, that's effective, that's good news because it's widespread, and ubiquitous. But what about the people who don't wanna work out in AA? Um, we need other kinds of things that can attract and engage people. And this is why, um, and this is kind of tantamount to only having a weight room in your fitness center or only having a yoga class in your fitness center where everybody has to do yoga or everybody has to go to the weight room. No, people to keep attract and engage people in physical fitness, we need to have a variety. The same is true, I would argue, of recovery. We need to have a variety of different options, uh, which uh, Smart Recovery provides one of those options um, uh, to help people, to attract people and engage people that are not interested in AA. Now, this is from a national recovery study, and you can see here, these are, this is over time, um, the, uh, the, purport, the number of people that are engaging in, in different mutual help organizations for the very first time, so the very first meeting, when they attended their first meeting of a mutual help organization. And you can see here that the, the kind of a decline in 12 step over, over these decades of, of people um, attending their first meeting starting in the 1980s, 90s, and an increase in other kinds of mutual health organizations, including secular groups like Smart Recovery and Life Ring, and also religious groups like Celebrate Recovery. There's been some um, naturalistic research that's been conducted. Alison gave a nice review of, of uh, a systematic review of some of the uh, quantitative and qualitative research. This is a a study by Sarah Zemore, which looked at uh, simultaneously. It's a nice study because it's, it's a naturalistic one in people self-selecting into these groups. And then they're measured over time. And she compared different, uh, uh, different groups. In this case, it was Smart Recovery, AA, Life Ring, and Women for Sobriety. So um, four different groups over, over the course of a year. And what she found was roughly equal benefit in terms of uh, uh, when you control for their drinking goal, uh, when they come into the study, um, that they benefited equally. So
So um, I think, again, it's important to provide different uh, menu options to engage and attract more people into recovery, given the burden of disease we have with alcohol and other drug use disorders. And smart recovery is providing that other very important, another very important option. So who affiliates with smart recovery? And this was really the purpose of my talk today. Uh, um, this is from an ongoing study. Uh, we've recruited 368 people um, who have uh, alcohol use disorder, who are starting a recovery attempt. So these are people who are saying, okay, I'm ready, I'm gonna start something new here, I'm gonna change my alcohol use. Um, they have an alcohol use disorder and I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-engage with something. It could be a smart recovery, AA, it could be both, or it could be nothing. So we thought we had these four groups of individuals who self-selected into one of these four pathways. So they said, yeah, I'm going to smart recovery. I just started going to smart recovery or I'm going to smart recovery and AA or I'm going to AA or I'm going to none of the above, okay? So there were four groups and we thought we're gonna follow these groups. We are following these groups for two years after they initially um, kind of self-select into one of these four uh, groups. So these were the measures um, uh, in terms of what we're collecting. Uh, demographics, uh, severity indicators of alcohol use disorder, uh, treatment history, um, and recovery resources and barriers, and functioning and quality of life and well being. They're the broad domains. So, what are we finding? Well, this is the, uh, the rough group. We've got a few more people now in each of these groups, I'm happy to say. Um, but the results I'm going to show you today probably won't change uh, very much with the addition of roughly 10 people per group. Uh, in addition to what we have here. So the estimates I'm gonna give you should be roughly correct, um, but don't take it to the bank yet. So uh, in terms of um, uh, the gender breakdown, there was no significant difference across groups um, in terms of uh, the number of women uh, attending groups proportionately. Um, as you can see here, the four, four groups are smart recovery on the left, AA, uh, then smart, people who went to smart and AA and people who went to neither. Uh, we had a few more people, um, obviously quite a few more who went to neither on the right here. Um, these are the kind of self changes or people who did not engage in either SMART or AA. Um, in terms of age, this was non-significant. It looks like SMART recovery has a little bit of an older uh, demographic, um, but uh, it wasn't significant. In terms of sexual orientation, Again, this was non-significant. Again, it looks like SMART has a little bit less, um, uh, fewer people with, who are sexual minorities. Um, this was also non-significant, but I think it's interesting um, is that uh, SMART recovery, it's, these are all very low, of course, in terms of the percentage of Hispanic individuals engaging. Um, but we're seeing um, uh, something here regarding potentially um, Latino or Latinx uh, individuals uh, perhaps a little bit more likely to engage in SMART. And, and, and there's something potentially about AA, which um, Hispanic individuals maybe don't like. Um, where we did see a difference, however, was in racial uh, composition, um, particularly white folks. So we have many more white folks attending SMART than other groups. Um, there were no individuals who identify as black or Asian um, or Alaska native in SMART recovery. Um, whereas there were quite a few that um, uh, identified in, as, in those categories um, uh, in AA or people who went to both or neither. Uh, where we are seeing a difference is in terms of kind of other kinds of recovery capital differences in terms of education, income, employment. Um, we see, for example, that people who are attending smart recovery tend to have um, uh, uh, higher levels of education, so it's quite, a, quite a bit higher level of education in terms of having a, a college degree or higher, um, uh, substantially higher income, um, more stable relationship status or living with someone, either being married or um, living with someone as if married. They have similar levels of alcohol use disorder severity. All of these groups were severe. Uh, mostly severe, a little bit more moderate in the SMART group um, compared to AA or SMART and AA. Um, and you can see the neither group is the standout here for those people. And we see this in other, many other studies that people who 
uh, are not choosing help, kind of external resources like SMART or AA uh, tend to be a little bit less severe. Um, but you can see um, uh, the severity uh, of alcohol use disorder was similar across SMART and um, AA and SMART and AA. The SMART group again had um, a difference here in terms of fewer alcohol use disorder consequences relative to the other uh, uh, help seeking groups. It was more similar to the NIDA group in terms of having fewer alcohol and drug consequences. And in terms of the alcohol use goal, um, smart recovery was more likely to, to have, um, um, a little bit more likely to have a, um, a non-abstinence goal, uh, but it was the neither group really, which was the big difference here in terms of um, uh, wanting to have a um, kind of more of a controlled use um, compared to uh, the other groups. Um, SMART was similar in terms of lifetime use of alcohol use disorder medications with other groups, uh, as well as mental health meds. And you can see that um, the neither group uh, was less likely to have used uh, alcohol use disorder medications. SMART recovery also was different in terms of prior hospitalizations and treatment utilization in terms of residential treatment, outpatient detox. Um, you see here quite a, quite a difference here in terms of uh, prior utilization. So again, it's kind of a pattern of lower severity um, and greater recovery capital among the SMART uh, uh, participants. In terms of uh, lifetime use of other recovery support services, this includes things like sober living environments. Again, we see a big difference. Um, SMART recovery individuals um, are less likely to have used uh, a sober living environment, recovery residences, um, as well as recovery community centers and uh, recovery high schools and collegiate recovery as well. Um, uh, again, a little bit less in terms of criminal justice involvement for SMART relative to AA and SMART plus AA, uh, more similar to the uh, neither group. And then commitment to sobriety was also significantly lower uh, in the SMART group relative to the AA group and the AA and SMART group. And um, yeah, so, so that's the picture um, uh, so, so far. Uh, let me just point out a few limitations um, um, of the data. Obviously, these are from the United States. They are in a particular region. Um, they are from actually from New England and San Diego County. So kind of Southwestern United States, Northeastern United States. Uh, results may vary in other regions, of course, in other countries. Um, they pertain to individuals, importantly remember, these are people with alcohol addiction, pretty much alcohol addiction. So more severe alcohol use disorder. Um, and it, we don't know about other primary drug problems. Um, and um, uh, we can't speak, these can't speak of course to benefits derived, but we will be able to hopefully inform uh, the answer to that question over time as we follow up with people. So just to end up here, um, so who affiliates with Smart Recovery relative to, to other groups? We find in this study so far, uh, and I think these are, these are pretty uh, concretized results, is that Smart Recovery is um, attracting people who are more likely to be white race, have higher income, more education, uh, and more likely to be in a marital or similar relationship. They tend to have lower alcohol use disorder consequences, are like, less likely to have been hospitalized or, to, uh, for, or, or be in treatment for alcohol use disorder in the past, or have utilized recovery residences or other recovery support services. They're slightly less likely to have an abstinence goal and to have, uh, also have lower criminal justice involvement, involvement. They have similar levels at baseline of quality of life, functioning and self-esteem. I didn't show those, they were non-significant uh, differences. They were similar at baseline here as they start their recovery attempt. So I think just importantly is that smart recovery, therefore, is providing something, something unique that is not attracting this particular demographic in AA, uh, that they are, it is attracting into smart recovery. People who have uh, lower levels of clinical pathology, higher levels of recovery capital, and yet still need and want some kind of ongoing support to help them in their recovery journey. And so smart recovery is attracting and engaging these individuals. And so uh, as we go on here, as we start to follow up these uh, groups over time, we'll see, see the extent to which they remain engaged with smart or other groups. 
We'll look to see the extent to which they migrate across groups or drop out. And of course, the benefit derived over time. So thank you so much um, to Smart Recovery for their assistance in this study, as well as NIAAA and my uh, collaborators and staff. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, John, thanks so much information. And um, I can see from the Q&A that people are really appreciative of all of the speakers. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly conscious that we may not get round to a full panel session at the end. So can I urge Charlie and Ali and yourself, John, to just check the Q&A, answer any questions you can. Um, if, if so, that would, that would be great. People loving the uh, fitness measure, the fitness analogy there I can see as well. Okay, let me um, now move on to our final speaker. And for anyone based in the UK, you will almost certainly know, or at least know of, Dr. Ed Day. Ed wears many important hats in our field. And not only is he a clinical reader, senior clinical lecturer and honorary consultant psychiatrist at the University of Birmingham, Ed is also our national recovery champion and president of the Society for the Study of Addiction. Ed somehow juggles teaching, research, clinical practice, policy work in a way that puts any of us who think we're busy to, to shame completely. He's one of the most committed people in our field that I know, and he's, it's always exciting to hear him talk, uh, particularly to hear his views on what we think, what he thinks we need to be doing in order to improve practice. And fortunately, that's what he's going to be talking about today. So Ed, over to you. What, what should we be doing and what should we be researching? Thank you very much, Joe. Um, yes, I, I will be hopefully briefer than the other speakers, and I'm going to try and pull together some of the themes that they've talked about so far. Um, thank you so much to, to Charlie, to uh, Alison, and to um, to uh, John for, for brilliant um, scene setting. And what I'm going to focus on is, is very much those of you that are from, apologies, but those of you that are from a UK audience, because this is a call to action about uh, SMART in the UK um, in both the clinical and the research sphere. And I think uh, we're being put to shame by our uh, esteemed colleagues in the United States and in Australia, um, because I think we can do more in, in this area. So let me see if I can move my slides along, which they're gonna make me do it that way. Okay, so just to recap, Charlie showed you a little bit about the state of um, problems with alcohol, drugs, and behavioral addictions in, in the UK. Uh, here's a couple of highlights again. Um, the graph on the left shows our extremely alarming uh, rise in drug-related deaths, uh, which seems to be going up inexorably, particularly in Scotland, but also in England, in the UK. And this slide um, was featured in Dane Carol Black's recent uh, part two report about the state of drugs in the UK, which really wrapped the UK government uh, across the knuckles, uh, saying that it, it really hadn't done enough in the last 10 years to um, address this issue and that more needed to be done on a number of different fronts. Uh, on the right, you've got the latest figures, which are which are not tremendously up to date, but but uh, but are still roughly correct, showing the numbers of people um, drinking at higher risk levels uh, and in dependent fashion in the UK. And alcohol remains our our uh, substance of choice, and and still continues to cause significant health and social problems um, throughout the UK. The, the other bit that doesn't get mentioned is, is the other uh, behavioural addictions. And I, I picked this report by YouGov uh, from last year about um, gambling treatment and support. This was looking at um, the number of people scoring uh, about one or above, i.e. meaning they have a, a problem gambling issue um, in, in the UK. And you've got, you've got about 3% of the, of the population scoring in the high uh, problem uh, group. And on the right, you have the services that they've accessed. And what this really highlights is, is at the moment, the dearth of services that are available for people with behavioral addictions in, in the UK. Um, and you can see in the midst of all that, there is, uh, it, it says a support group, e.g. Gamblers Anonymous 2%. So we'll come back to that uh, later on. Uh, this document came out just before Christmas. This is the, the UK government's 10-year uh, drug strategy from harm to hope. And it's a drug strategy because the government very much focuses on uh, drugs, mainly because of the crime associated with it. But, but there's an acknowledgement that it also, it also relates to the alcohol field as well. And this, this stemmed directly from Dame Carol Black's report, uh, outlining all the many problems that there were with our system. 
uh, largely due to uh, 10 years of austerity, of cuts to, to services, steady and relentless cuts, and also some factors to do with reorganization of services and movement of addiction services out of the, out of the uh, NHS and into local authorities. Um, when I talk about this document uh, as UK recovery champion, I always set this in the scene, uh, I always show this slide because it's important to recognize that um, problems with uh, substances, whether they're alcohol, drugs, or, or behavioral addictions occur across a spectrum. So we have a complete spectrum from people that don't use at all on one end, through to people that use um, with possibly many benefits and, and no real problems, moving right through on, what, on the other end to people with, with what we would call um, in ICD-11 terms dependence, but, but or, or severe or moderate to severe uh, substance use uh, disorder. And of course, perhaps that group are the tip of the iceberg. They're the bit that's visible above the waterline, but below the waterline, there's a huge group of people who are maybe developing problems or have problems at a significant level and haven't um, done anything about that. And, and at the bottom of the screen, you've, you've got what is required to manage an issue like this. And that is a, a full range of different interventions. So. We, we have to have everything from um, sort of public uh, health measures at one end, um, focusing on, on educating the, the general public and primary prevention through to treatment in the middle, which is the bit that I, I mostly work in, in specialist treatment services. But of course, the final um, bubble on the right hand side is the bit that I really um, have promoted during the, the development of the new drug strategy, and that's recovery support. Because I think if we look at what's happened in the last 10 years in the UK, this is the part of the system that's been largely um, uh, ignored or cut as money has been um, saved. And I have to keep um, talking about what recovery is um, because we still get people reverting back to a, a sort of shorthand that recovery equals abstinence. Well, of course, it doesn't equal abstinence. It, abstinence may well be a part of it, but, but there's no one path to recovery. Recovery to me, um, and I use the, the UK DPC definition here, has three elements. It requires control over, over the, the problematic behaviour, substance use. It involves maximised health, be that uh, physical health or mental health. And, and, and perhaps most importantly, it involves um, full participation in the rights, roles and responsibilities of society, meaningful activity to get up for every day. And, and if your level of, of um, addiction or dependence or whatever terminology you're using is high at the start, this is a process that can take uh, a long time to achieve. It involves a lot of effort, um, uh, both to achieve it and to maintain it. Um, and, and because of that, it requires people to be surrounded by um, aspirational thinking, um, hope. And it, I'm a big believer that, that the opposite of addiction is connection um, and linking to other groups, particularly peer support, um, can be a key uh, element in that, in that recovery journey. And I like to think and talk about um, the um, recovery can be can be measured and monitored through an accrual of positive benefits or, or, or recovery capital, uh, as we often think of it. Um, I, I show this because in my role as recovery champion, one of the things we found in the UK is that, that 10 years ago or more, we had a very politically driven uh, process to pitch different parts of our treatment system against each other. So you, you either had to be in the harm reduction camp at one end of the spectrum or the abstinence based recovery end at, at the other end of the spectrum. And, and people were sort of there was a, there's been a period where people spend a lot of time arguing with each other as to which is the right approach. And I've been one of my goals, two goals as recovery champion. One is to ensure that we deliver evidence based practice. The second is to ensure that we all unite against the common problem here. And that is the stigma of addiction and the fact that, that the government was allowed to cut services for people with addiction steadily over 10 years. So I, I constantly bring that man, mantra back that I want all elements of the treatment system for all pathways to recovery. So that I, I'm, I'm massively for any harm reduction uh, intervention that engages people in a process right through to I'm, I'm for any form of uh, recovery support or, or mutual aid that, that helps people um, uh, establish and maintain recovery. And when I talk about this, I show this diagram to try and um, get this point across to policymakers and, and indeed clinical colleagues in the field. And if you think of this diagram on the left hand side, you have people, shall I say, are in addiction. And on the right hand side is, is recovery. 
as there are many ways of moving across. So, so natural recovery at the top, as uh, you know, John and others have alluded to, many people, many people get from one place to the other without any form of support from others. They do it all through their own um, resources, and that's great. We, of course, have mutual aid processes, and John and, and others have talked a lot about that. So SMART would fit within that um, uh, umbrella. But again, incredibly uh, helpful and successful way of doing things. And then the, in the middle of the diagram, you have what I see as the as the um, the sort of recovery orientated system. And the bits in green are the bits that, that often we focus on in the acute care clinical system. But equally important is, are the bits in blue, which are the recovery community and what, I, what we call now um, lived experience recovery organization. So this is the power of, of peer support to deliver uh, recovery support services and the different sort of elements that John particularly has been very um, articulate in, in, in elaborating and uh, evidencing um, in our field. And I, I uh, push this diagram as saying that if in an ideal world, what should be available to everyone in the UK is the best quality acute care, medical stabilization if necessary, and then long-term management and recovery support services over a period of time. I think this is important because um, if we come back to SMART, I think SMART has in the UK a crucial role in the, um, the menu of options that are available, both in the mutual aid world, but also in the treatment world. So you've heard from Charlie that, that the benefits of SMART are that it can be delivered on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, but it can also be delivered in treatment services. And indeed that's how things happen at the moment in, in the UK. And that, that it's a crucial um, alternative to our sort of brand leader, which would be the 12 step fellowships in the UK. Um, nothing against the 12 step fellowships. I think the, the absolutely wonderful organizations as John's shown have a massive, provide massive benefit to people. But it's certainly true, particularly in, set, in the secular UK that, that a lot of people find it very hard to engage um, with the process. And so we have to have alternatives are available to people and SMART fits that bill absolutely perfectly. So the first part of my call to action is, is a demand for all parts of the system to, to look at things like SMART and indeed I would welcome the support of other approaches if that was as, as John showed that, that's available in the, in the US but less so in the UK. The other side of what I wanted to mention was, uh, was about um, uh, research and as I, as I highlighted at the beginning, we're, we're slightly lagging behind um, the other countries in terms of um, looking at this. Here's a slide from John's fabulous uh, Recovery Research Institute, which I take as very much a model in, in the UK. And I've been driving a process to try and create a UK Addiction Recovery Research Institute to try to um, give parity of esteem to work in that recovery support space. Because at the moment, the UK has been brilliant at um, synthesizing um, research evidence and putting it into practice. We have NICE, which is, is sort of world leading organization in terms of uh, synthesizing uh, evidence from, for, for interventions and, and proving their economic worth. But the recovery support space has been left behind in, in that, um, in that uh, uh, narrative and that debate. So I'm pushing to develop this. And I put up thing, uh, diagrams like this, sort of my ideas about what would be on a UK recovery research agenda. And within this, SMART would, there are, there are massive opportunities for evaluating and researching SMART as part of this process. So I'm in the, mo at the moment, as we speak, um, replicating John's uh, National Recovery Survey in the UK through YouGov, and that will look at the um, people's use of SMART and other mutual aid groups as part of their recovery journey. Um, I'm trying with the UK government to map the provision of recovery support services uh, across England and look at where, well, I know where they work well, but I don't know what happens in many areas of the country. And we have a slight postcode lottery, um, which I want to um, uh, demonstrate. Um, I want to encourage the creation of um, cohort studies, uh, particularly looking at mid to late recovery phases, which have been, um, which, which have been totally neglected in, in the UK research um, thus far. I want to look at interventions that cross the divide. So in my diagram with the two, um, the two elements, clearly there are linking strategies, many, many linking strategies going backwards and forwards between the two. And these need evaluation and, and SMART may well be one of those interventions that potentially spans both uh, sides of the, of, of the uh, diagram. 
and and also let's we we need um better uk based uh, um evaluations of recovery based interventions of which mutual aid uh, and smart is one and just as a as a final point i want to flag up a couple of other areas to focus that smart has a massive potential in the UK. One is in the development of collegiate recovery programs. And, and this is the University of Birmingham where I work. And I'm pleased to say that we've developed um, with some philanthropic funding, the first UK driven collegiate recovery program, which of course very um, prominent in, in the US, but, but not so in the UK. So we have a program called Better Than Well, which is a, um, a peer led uh, support service linked to um, some um, university based uh, well being services which which I lead, and this is going this has been running for just one semester so far, and we already have engaged um, 15 to 30 students who are in recovery absent recovery from from a variety of different addictions. Now i'm pleased to say that we've got um, as part of our sort of um, overarching program to develop this we've encouraged the wellbeing services to be the first uh, university in the UK to actually put on smart groups on campus. And I think they have tremendous potential for all students at whatever stage of that recovery journey they may be, but also for staff. Uh, I think there's a potential um, uh, for our several thousand staff for, for utilizing those um, services as well. And then finally, just to flag up a couple of other, other areas, um, Charlie mentioned behavioral addictions and again, this is an area that's totally um, underserved in the UK. Uh, very few uh, research studies looking at the extent of these problems and very limited support available. And I think SMART has, has all the tools to potentially help this population and to help us evaluate what helps this population. And then just to flag up something Joe's mentioned already, I think um, uh, mobile health or, or digital interventions have a real um, potential and particularly with our experiences post uh, during the COVID pandemic and, and afterwards, I think there's a real opportunity to look at the um, digital uh, manifestations of SMART, either in the delivery, but also in the outcome um, monitoring um, afterwards. So, Joe, I'll leave it there and hopefully leave a few minutes for, for, for questions. Thanks, Ed. That's <clears throat> excellent. I think um, if we were scoring ourselves on uh, the volume of content, the information imparted, um, we'd get 10 out of 10 on this. If we were scoring ourselves on the time left for questions, I'm afraid I think we're going to get pretty much zero. But I'm not going to let you escape without one question each. And I'll take you, well, actually, I'll ask you all the same question, but in reverse speaker order. So, Ed, you've, you've sort of helped us to set out the future a little bit and things that we should be prioritising. Let me put you each on the spot and I'm going to ask you each for one topic, hot topic, that we should be researching as the most priority issue going forward. Ed, what would you say? Uh, for me, definitely it's students, because I think uh, that, that um, we've totally neglected uh, our student, our huge student population in the, in, in the UK. And it really, and starting this programme, it's really brought it home to me how intervening at this stage, often with a predominantly younger students, 18 to 21 age group uh, university students, if we can intervene at that stage, we can potentially divert a long and, and in some cases problematic addiction career throughout their life. And I'm really, I, I've been really struck by the dearth of support for particularly that student population. They find it hard to access the existing services for young people. They fall between adolescent services and adult services. And they're a different population. Hearing John talk about the, the difference um, between those accessing SMART and other interventions, I really think SMART could be the perfect intervention for this group on campus. That would be my point, Joe. Excellent. Right, John, over to you. One yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, it's great to hear everybody. Um, I, I think I would just amplify what Ed said in terms of understanding, you know, for whom it works and how it works um, in terms of smart recovery. You know, who in particular uh, engages with smart and how does it help them achieve recovery? Again, this is such a valuable addition to the menu of options uh, for people seeking recovery and understanding for whom it's for and also how it confers benefit, um, uh, which it undoubtedly does, uh, which, which would be where I would go. I think another thing would be cost effectiveness. Uh, because I think this is smart recovery is going to also be shown to be cost effective, just like AA. Brilliant. Ali, one from you. Um, 
I think I'll add to, to those ones with um, mental health. So just thinking about, especially in Australia, that sort of hole that people can sometimes fall down if you have a um, mental health condition, if you have a substance use condition and who it is that's actually going to help you with that. Um, I think Smart Recovery has a real um, unique opportunity potentially to be able to help people um, not fall down that gap. And echoing John's point, um, who does it work for under what circumstances because obviously it's not going to be a one size fits all for everyone but under what circumstances can it be useful to um, help people with uh, mental health experience Superb. and last but not least charlie okay so from me i think it would be around um the development of a standardized and validated self-reported outcomes measurement tool so for people with co-occurring, problematic behaviours, engaging in SMART, how can we find a way for them to self-report in a key standardised set of outcome measures that could then be utilised across um, all different research protocols in the world? Super, excellent. Ambition there. Um, what's been great is alongside the, uh, the talks and the presentations online, there's been this really great stream of uh, Q&A going on at the side, which I hope we've all had a chance to look at. Uh, people have raised some comments and well, made some comments, raised some questions. We've had some answers. I'm afraid we're, we're running out of time, uh, but hopefully the session has sparked some interest in smart recovery and smart recovery research. Uh, we've really listened to some key players in the field and they've provided us with some excellent insights. Um, so also pointed us to some references and resources for anybody who's interested in learning a bit more. Now, there, there is also a Smart Recovery Global Research Network, which you can apply to join. And I tried this yesterday. If you type Smart Global, no, if you type Smart Recovery Global Research Network into a browser, it does actually pop up with the information you need and a form. And um, so that's an option for anybody who's interested. Um, as I've already said, this session has been recorded and thanks to Ted Perkins for organising that. So it's going to be available on the Smart Recovery affiliate website soon. Uh, the PowerPoint slides will also be available. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a second webinar organised for March the 10th. And this one will be chaired by uh, Professor Katie Vitovitz from the University of New Mexico in the US. And the speakers will be John and Ali again. So a little bit of similar content, but this time joined by Dr. Tom Horvath, who's a clinical psychologist, president of Practical Recovery and founding board member, member of Smart Recovery USA. Uh, the second webinar is organized at a more US friendly timing. So that will be 8 p.m. UK time, but bang in the middle of the afternoon, 3 p.m. for people in New York. So that's another one if you're interested in learning more. Otherwise, I think I'd just like to thank all the speakers for their presentations. Uh, behind the scenes, we've had Kim, Pete, Ted and others helping organise. And of course, uh, most obviously yourselves for, for listening and asking the questions and keeping the chat alive. If, it's, uh, if you're in Australia, New Zealand, um, probably get yourself to bed now. And anywhere else, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks for everyone. Want to have a lot of fun, get fit, and help support a really meaningful cause this April? Join the 30-day Take On Addiction Fundraising Challenge. Just sign up to walk, run, cycle, or choose your own activity to raise money for Smart Recovery, a global leader in mutual support services that empowers people everywhere to take back control of their lives and gain total freedom from their addictions. Sign up is quick and easy. Create your monthly fundraising challenge, invite your friends, form teams, share your results, celebrate your accomplishments, and get in the best shape of your life, knowing you're helping Smart Recovery smash the stigma of addiction and heal individuals and their communities everywhere. What are you waiting for? Just go to takeonaddiction.org and start helping people everywhere lead life beyond addiction today.